What we got here is the Pascal S-Lock waterproof zip. So what we need to understand is why use it? Pretty straightforward as to why you would use it. It's, it is what it says here. It is a waterproof zip. We'll do a demonstration shortly. It takes away from a fabricator's point of view the need to actually weatherproof the zip. There's a lot, it's a very time consuming exercise to make that waterproof. Hidden, yes, so that maybe you can't see the zip, but it takes time and that's money. So what we're here to do to talk about today is yes, the zip is a dearer product, but it saves time. So your labor costs as compared to the cost of the zip can be weighed up. The benefit, the, the ultimate benefit is for the customer. Customer goes and purchases all of these quality canvases that are waterproof, and then for his, from, from a historical point of view, we've then gone and put a, a, a zip that's not waterproof. We've been working with Pascal in developing this, and historically we have tried other zips that and other companies do make that are waterproof. Well, they're water resistant, and they're not 100% waterproof. This zip here, is. From a customer's point of view, that's exactly what he wants. A couple of little issues when you're, when you're motoring along in a, in a seaway, most boaties will understand is that, okay, I'm going to use a hose on it here with a pressure top on it. In a seaway, when you're motoring home and your zips are closed, what happens is the boat will be punching through, obviously, a wave with a quarter on spray or the breeze coming quarter onto the boat. The acceleration of that spray hits this zip here and with a non-waterproof zip, it splinters through. Now if that happens at a helm situation, what you're talking about is somebody standing at a helm situation trying to navigate the boat with their zips in place and water coming through the zips. Unacceptable from my point of view and I think a customer should demand a waterproof zip. It just makes common sense. Pascal have developed this. There are some idiosyncrasies with it. It is a tougher zip to use. This one's nice and warm today, so it works very easily. But it is a harsher zip to use. I still believe the benefits outweigh the harshness of the zip. So as I say today, it's a nice warm day, so the zip works beautifully. We're gonna do a demonstration later on just to explain to you how to use it in an eyebrow, uh, a U-zip situation. So again, you need to make some modifications in your uh, manufacturing styles. Likewise here, as I say, we would have in the past, we would have made, we would have hidden this zip because we needed to waterproof it. And again, we're only hiding it and waterproofing it from water like this. But in actual fact, in a seaway, again, going back to the seaway, the water comes in, goes through our waterproof, waterproof flap and shh, splinters in through the backing of the zip. That doesn't happen here. So what we've got is we've got an ultimate product for the customer. So it gives us the opportunity to upsell from a cheaper zip to this zip, which is an absolute benefit for the client. So there we have it, waterproof zip. Now there may be water coming in from other areas where there are seams, but I doubt it very much. But there you have a customer who's just spent his time out in the bay. He's now washed his boat down. He can wash it from the outside. He doesn't need to go inside because there's no water gone in there. He's ready to go home. This is a U-zip or a smiley face. I call them an eyebrow. Very widely used on fly bridges, sports cruises. Now, okay, I'm holding a hose on it, but what we want to try and do is simulate you going through a seaway where the water is coming from the bow and splashing up on the boat like that. Now under a hose's rate, well, it's not hard, but if you're in a heavy seaway, you're gonna make sure that this boat's dry and, and driving from the helm position, you wanna be dry. You don't wanna be distracted by the fact that there's water coming in the zips. We put a zip on the side curtain for this just for ventilation, but we use the, use the uh, waterproof zip for that. This is the most critical one from a helm position. The skipper's there by the wheel, water's splashing over the bow, and what you don't want is you don't want water coming in, distracting him. So here we are in the workshop, we've made our patterns, we've come from the pattern process, we've now ready to make our clears for our 
to show our style for the technique. Now, what we've got here is we've got three styles of zips, all very high quality zips. These two are Pascal zips. This is the S-Lock number 10 chunky zip, fully waterproof. Pascal have the standard plastic locking slider, very good quality. This is the competitor zip, which is a very high quality zip, it's a number 10 zip. Traditionally, a lot of us have used these over the years. This is the problem with, with using these in a waterproof situation is that they're not. Great zip. I would never ever say that they're not a fantastic zip. They are a very high quality zip. They're just not waterproof. And I think we can do better for our customers. And from a fabricator's point of view, we need to look at ways of upselling our products. This is a great value added product to the client. This was another zip that Pascal make, uh, which is a number 10 coil zip. It has a waterproof backing on it. Now we worked, we attempted to use these, and again, uh, a coil zip will much prefer to do a use zip with. Problem is that if I hold this up to the light, and this is really important because once this is manufactured, this is loaded up. We will load the cover up as in we will pull tension uh, fore and aft, um, back and forward, side to side. But what you'll see is, when I pull on each side of the tab, you'll see the light will come through from the coil. So this is what it looks like normally, where there's no light coming through. But when the zip's loaded up, which it invariably will be, that's what happens. Now, if you can see light through it, you're going to get water through it. Really important distinction. Here's our S-Lock, number 10. Same pressure applied, no light coming through. No light coming through, no water coming through. From the pattern stage, we now have to go to the manufacturing stage. Now, this is where we need to be aware of how we're going to use this. The beauty of that other zip, the white zip that I showed you, was it's a lot more flexible in the tape, the backing of the zip. This is a lot more stiff, so we this is the ideal scenario. We've got our, our eyebrow marked here, our smiley face, our U-zip, whatever um, you like to call them. So traditionally what we would have done is we would have grabbed one of those other two zips. We would have put a single stitch on the outside to sit, set it in place. We then would have run a secondary stitch on the outside. We would have run an internal stitch. So that would have given us one, two st stitches, then a third stitch on the inside here. What we then would have done is we would have cut the zip because we wanted to make it waterproof. Now, we wanted to waterproof a non-waterproof zip. We would have then taken the clears apart. We would have then added to the clear another piece of clear to give it that extra coverage over the zip. What we would have normally done is we would have made sure that this had a minimum of five mil coverage, sometimes 10. So in a manufacturing sense, what you're doing is you're going one, two, three stitches, stopping production, removing the zip, grabbing another piece of clear, fitting the other piece of clear to, the, to your job, sewing that in, reinforcing it, zipping your zip back up and sticking another stitch in. Now, in real terms from, for this job, that might take you anything from 30 minutes to an hour. To way I think, this zip is three times dearer than its competitor. Now, in the sense of how it weighs up from a financial point of view, I firmly believe that the time that you have saved on the bench far outweighs the cost of this. But having said that, of course, you've already got more for the job anyway because you have added value for the customer and you've compensated yourself more. So three times dearer, not something you would throw in without really thinking about it, but to my way of thinking, I believe this is the best zip on the market at the moment. So the next step is to machine it. So let's go through that process whereby we're going to stitch the zip into the clear. We set ourselves up. Ideally when you're doing clears, we have a, a velour on our bench top here, which is a padded velour. So it has a nine mil backing on it. So if ever the, the job is, is dragged around on the bench, it has a reinforcing 
plus a soft touch. You'll see we have a cutout here for the walking foot machine. Ideal scenario. Okay, so let's just cover a couple of bases. Ideally, you're doing clears, you want to make sure your bench is clean. You really want to make sure your hands are clean. I know this isn't relevant to the zip, but it's really important. You don't want to leave smears on here, moisturiser, sunblock, all those sorts of things do have an issue. Another really important thing is take your watch off if you wear it on your left hand because you're going to be swinging th this clear through the machine. You don't want your hand scratching the clear. Take your watch off, put it aside. Now, the way that I do and all of my staff are instructed is always to make sure that you mark your U-zip on the outside of the clear. How do you know it's on the outside? Well, we use a, a, a marker pencil. I just quickly put my hand on it like that, and that will rub out the pencil line. Just so that if I show you that again. So I'm on the outside. Let's come through. So that's the outside. We want to put the U-zip on the inside. I turn that over. I have my line to mark to, to sew to. Okay, a couple of other things that are extremely important is not only does your bench have to be clean, but it has to be clear. So you want to make sure that you've got your zip fixed in a position that's not going to be impeding the movement of the clear. You want to make sure all your tools are in positions whereby they're not going to fall or they're not going to slide in underneath on your job. Very important. So naturally enough, the waterproof side of the zip is the shiny side. We're sewing the inside of the, uh, the, the clear. So what I want to do is want to put that down like so. I line it up with this. I've locked my start. Always put the, the mark on the outside because when you go to clean it, just clean it off. You don't try and stitch over it. It's just your guide for you to put the edge of the zip to the marker. Now, critical. What we want to do is we want to make sure we keep tension on this thing. So if, if I have no tension here and a little bit here, I want to make sure that I sew this really firmly. So how do I do that? I can't sew that like this. I have to come up with a technique. And again, it's just a, a coordination thing, whichever works best for you. I don't have my watch on, so I'm not going to scratch the clear. What I have to do is I have to come up with a technique that helps me to manoeuvre the clear through, but at the same time, pull tension on the zip. So my way of doing it is I, I grasp it between my thumb and my first finger. I then use that finger to pull tight on there. This will become apparent as to why we have to try and make sure that we allow the zip to slide. What some may have noticed is the size of the radius. The radius that we would normally use on a coil zip enclosure, we would use a 240 millimeter radius or nine inches, nine and a half inches. What we've done with the S-lock, we've increased the size of the radius to 400 millimeters. Now, some may think that's a little alarming, but what that does, it allows the zip to move freely, which is really, really important. Very, very difficult for a zip, especially a chunky zip, to run through a sharp radius. So what we've done, we haven't increased it a little bit, we've increased it a lot. Now that all goes back to design, about the way that you're going to then have your clears look. Most importantly, make sure that we work with the product that we have. It's the best product, so as a professional fabricator, you want to make sure you're doing the best thing for your client with the best product you can buy. So just to finish off on that point, if that were a tighter radius, this would be very difficult for this zip to, to slide through. So I've, at every moment, I've, I've grasped the zip again, and I'm pulling with my finger here quite firmly. I'm keeping tension on this all the way until my last stitch. At no time do I want the zip to gather on the clear. Being opposing fabrics, the feed dogs on the machine, they may grab one or the other, so you want to make sure as a professional fabricator that you are 
working your machine and your area correctly. Efficiently, I guess is the best way to say. So these come in 100 metre rolls, and again, like the open-ended zips, they're expensive, but they're the best product. As far as threads go, we use a, a 90, number 92, which we find is a polyester thread. You can use a PDFE thread quite comfortably. So, second stitch that we do. Very important that we continue to understand how this zip is going to sit down. So as you can see, it's sitting up. We've got to get this to sit flat. We want to make sure that when we come to the start of the radius, we want to try and make sure the zip is flat. And my technique, everyone may have a different technique, my technique is to actually push the zip towards the needle of the machine. That way it's not racing in front of itself and it will always hopefully be exactly opposed tooth for tooth. So that's our technique, we just massage the zip towards the machine quite simple. The next stitch is quite difficult and needs some understanding. What you're attempting to do, I touched on it a minute ago, is you're attempting to make sure that the zip lines up tooth for tooth. Now in a radius situation, as you can see, that's got to lay flat. So what we have to make sure we do, we don't want to end up, we don't want massive folds like this in it. What we are happy to do is just get some small puckers like that but we need to make sure that at no time is this sewn like this or this sewn like this, where you're opposing the teeth. We want to make sure the teeth, as they come through with the slider, match up nicely. So how do we do that? Lots of different techniques. Some may use an awl, some may use a skewer. It's quite simple. Some people may even just push it back with their fingers. Whatever works for you. My technique is I grab a skewer. The reason for the skewer is that I can put the skewer close to the side of the foot and the machine can run over with my skewer in place. So, here I come up to my radius here. I'm pushing that back in very slightly. I'm throwing puckers in because I know that I need to to get the zip to lay flat. More importantly, to make the zip slide. That's the most important thing. You don't want teeth overlapping one another. So as I get deeper into the radius, I have to throw a larger fold. I believe that's very acceptable for what is the end result for your client. So as I get around to the straighter part, I still don't back off. I don't let the skewer go. I can use a technique like this. That is my preference. I put the skewer into there. So this is the, the lighter side of the zip as the other side has the rubber coating on the underside. Our second stitch picks up that rubber coating and then that gives you that wonderful bond. So very, very important that, that be very particular, like any technique, like all machines are very different. The feet size on all the machines can be very varying sizes, so it's whatever works in your workshop. So again, I'm, I'm accepting the fact that there will be some puckers in this zip. I realise that there are some offsets to the benefit of the waterproof zip. Being a stiffer zip, means there is some compromise. I think it's very acceptable. I'm now on the straight section where I finish off my zip. I put my skewer away. I continue to sew. So this is the stage I spoke about earlier where we would have then stopped and if I can show this for the camera, the way that we did it was a very, very good waterproof way. I would then 
take my, I'll use a white pencil, I would then grab my shears and I would cut above the top tooth there, then I would separate these two zips, I would then water, add an extra flap that overlapped at least to here, at a minimum, five, ten millimetres, so I'd sew another stitch one time, because I've overlapped the clear, I want to make sure it looks neat, so I'd put another edge on, two more stitches, and then I had what I refer to as a very waterproof zip. In actual fact, it wasn't waterproof. Because with wind and with, with the force of the water, it could still get through. There you have it. There's the three stitch lines, which was our stop point previous to using these. And you can see just through on the light there, that puckering of the underside. We're going to stitch through that rubberizing like we have here to totally seal it. Still haven't cut the clear yet. This is my last stitch. And then I'm going to cut the clear. So again, whatever spacing works for anybody's machine is how you would then sew this next line. I want to make sure at a minimum that my stitch picks up the rubber coating on the underside, the waterproof coating. So there I have, I'm not using my skewer anymore because I'm satisfied that I've got the teeth lined up quite nicely. I'm not sewing that zip anymore, that's it. I've sewn it onto the clear. I'm now thinking of the next part of my job. Well, the next part of this job is to cut this. I know that it's waterproof. I can effectively cut it anywhere I like. What I have found is that I much prefer to still give it a little bit of coverage. In this situation, there's no real reason for me to do it. I just don't want the water sitting in a valley on that lower stitch. So just to reinforce what I said, I could cut this right through the centre. What that may allow the water to do is just sit on the stitch here. I don't want that. I'm going to cut it right there. Now, why am I going to cut it there? Because that doesn't give it a lot of space for the water to sit. Plus, if I have any shower over the top, Dirt, grime's not going to get in the zip. So effectively, I guess the answer is, why do I do it? To keep the grime out. I don't want the grime to go into the zip teeth. So there I have it. I've now very gently slid, slid through. So I've got to peel that up so you can see the fact that that's exactly how it's going to look, keeping the grime, the dust and the dirt out. So I just very gently and efficiently, making sure that I don't pick up some of those puckers with the underside of my shears. Very important, otherwise you could go right through it and you'd have to start again, and we don't want that. The whole idea of this is to improve your manufacturing time and at the same time give the customer the best product that's available. So there I have it. I've now got a covered zip. So this, in situ, this will sit, it's an eyebrow. I refer to them as an eyebrow. Some will call it a U-zip. So what happens, this is at the helm. So I'm here at the helm, I'm on the inside of the clear. This is the weather flap here, the dust flap, I should call it now. What we've got is we've now got a totally waterproof zip. So when I'm driving the boat, I'm not gonna get wet. I know I'm not gonna get wet. Last thing to do is put your zip sliders on. What Pascal offers is, for the S-Lock zip, three styles of zip. These are uh, powder coated enamel. Some would say that you wouldn't use these in a marine situation because of electrolysis. I can't argue. The reason I do use them is because they're easier to use. This is a, a beefier, harder zip to use. Locking though. So if you're looking for a locking zip slider, this is, your bait. This is the one that you want to use. It has a, a mechanism inside there. Each of them are usable in this situation. Again, if you wish to use 
the double pull, which will allow you to open this clear from outside the boat or inside the boat, you have that option. You then have the easy slide action of the enamel uh, powder coated cast zip, or you have the plastic. So either one, if you want a double pull, you want to work it only on the inside. How are you going to do it? Our method is quite simple. You've sewn the zip in, you don't need to put the sliders in until you've finished it. Pull the zip apart. Note before you've taken the zip apart which tooth is above the other. Grab your zip slider. We know we've got to use this in the inside, so let's, let's turn it over. This is an inside, single sided. We know that the, my, the, the zip on my left has to be the first tooth in. I grab my zip slider so that I'm working with a closed zip the whole time. I slide my zip on like so. I make sure that's right. I grab the other tail on the other side. So I have my zip in place. I now keep in mind, I mentioned earlier uh, on other occasions that they are a tighter zip to use. So you must be fairly forceful with the way that you use these things in Shitsu. So your slide is here, okay? It is difficult. It does free up after a couple of uses. So to check that it's all okay, I want to make sure my zip is parallel. I want to make sure my zip is parallel all the way through my radius. So it's not jumping forward of the other. At no point is the zip jumping. It's working nicely. It's stiff, granted that it is stiff. But there you have it. We, what we'll try is we'll try with the plastic slider which is the locking slider. To start the locking slider, because of the mechanism inside the zip tooth, you must use a little action whereby you unlock the slider. So you must feed the teeth in, like so. Put our second one in, which is a little tricky. Put our second one into the, the body of the zip. Unlock our zip, make sure our teeth line up correctly. I haven't got my teeth lined up. Now I do. Get the zip, unlock the zip slider, and just pull gently on that. And again, it's a bulkier, heavier zip. So I've, I've lined it up correctly. My left hand side tooth is the first tooth. I am exerting a reasonable amount of force to make this work. That is much more difficult to use than the, than the powder coated version, but it is a locking zip. I don't use them in this U-shaped scenario. I prefer to use those on a side curtain where it's a vertical up and down situation where you may want the zip to be halfway, to turn it in, whatever works best. Most of all, the reason for the, the locking slider is so that the wind can't actually tear the zip apart. You don't want that to happen. The other alternative is the double slider. Again, be very forceful with the way that you use it. It prefers to, to be interlocked quicker rather than slower, making sure we don't jam the teeth. Again, just a little technique of knowing that you've got that first zip tooth on. So I'm inside the boat, I can undo. I'm outside the boat, I can undo. Whatever purpose suits best for you and your client, that's what you need to do. Plenty of choices. Yes, they will corrode with a little bit of electrolysis. What I tell my clients to do, just use the zips. Simple as that. The more you use them, the longer they'll last. That, in real time, to put a U-zip in there, is probably 15 minutes work. Had I have then gone and made my additions to all those other things, I may have added another 30 minutes, maybe another 40 minutes, depending on which machinist has done it. You add that up and you put on a flybridge scenario four zips, three times bigger than that, you add in the time that you have taken to make that waterproof zip. I think that the waterproof zip is great value, great value for us as fabricators, great value for customers, and I highly recommend this is the product you need to look at.